Well, hello. Welcome, everyone, to the July 2020 edition of the St. Louis Java Users Group meeting. Thanks for putting up with all of the technical issues and everything we're having to sort through uh, to make this all possible. I have a few announcements just to explain what the St. Louis Java Users Group is. Attendance is free. There's no formal membership list. We normally meet on the second Thursday of every month except December when there is no meeting. When we meet in person, we normally uh, start with food and social at 6, and the presentation starts roughly about 6.30 p.m. When we do meet in person, our meeting location is the Object Computing Incorporated Training Room at 12140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310, in St. Louis, but because of the, the pandemic, we're going to try to see if we can keep things going here online and keep everybody safe. I'd like to introduce the members of our steering committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, me in the middle, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Zwang. You can reach us on the steering committee at this email here that should be at the bottom of the of the slide, chavasigsc at ociweb.com. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the help of our sponsors. So I'd like to thank Object Computing Incorporated for providing the web hosting and the meeting location. I'd like to thank Edward Jones because they've been paying for the meetup subscription fees. It's free for you to attend the meetings, but it costs us to be able to host meetings, and Edward Jones covers that cost, so that way everyone can attend for free. Signature Consultants uh, sponsors food when we do meet in person about every third meeting. And we also have Adaptive Solutions Group, and they sponsor a meeting uh, with food every third meeting, except we're online now. But they'll have some prizes here. If you stick around, uh, we'll do some raffles. JetBrains sponsors uh, JetBrains licenses. We'll have two of those at the end of the meeting. I'll give you the details in just a moment. Elastic, when we do meet, they have some some gift cards that we raffle. Intertech sponsors the famous Screaming Flying Monkeys. Basically, they're little monkey dolls, and if you toss them against the wall, they scream. Oh, they're so much fun. Manning sponsors some ebooks, and we'll be raffling a couple of those at the end of the meeting. And Pearson will, on occasion, provide some physical books uh, to keep the for the for the door prizes. As far as upcoming presentations go, on August 13th, we have Architecture Foundations, Styles, Patterns, and Trade-offs by Neil Ford. And on October 8th, we have This Ain't Your Parents Java by Venkat, well, I'll give it a try, Subramanium. That's probably wrong. Sorry, Venkat, if you're watching the video, if I got your last name mispronounced. So if you're interested in giving a presentation, uh, you can email us on the steering committee with a bio and abstract at that email address there on your screen. It says javasigsc at ociweb.com. And if any changes happen to our presentation schedule, uh, they'll be posted on, on Meetup. So just watch the Meetup page. If there's any updates, they will be there. So at the end of the meeting, we'll have some raffles. Oh, oh, oh. I almost forgot. We do have a recruiter who would like to give a, a two-minute uh, introduction. Uh, Thomas, are you there? Let's see if we can, we can get you in. And I believe you're sponsoring some gift cards, which you like to. Can we turn the meeting over to him for just a couple of minutes to talk about Adaptive Solutions Group, if we can get you in here? Okay, it looks like, well, I don't, I don't see anything, so he's not coming in. So 
anyway, he has some gift cards that we'll be raffling here at 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 the end. So if anyone would like to participate in the raffle and the presenter is eligible to win, use the chat feature that's in your uh, meeting software there, and you can send your name and your email to Ted Doyle because he's on our steering committee and he will be handling the raffle at the end of the meeting when Dahlia is done with the presentation. So I think with all of that, uh, we should be pretty much good to go. So I'll turn things over to Dahlia to talk about how to migrate beyond Java 8. So Dahlia, why don't you make sure we're still recording and uh, take it from here. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, we are still recording. I see the sign at the top there. Um, so I can steal your share and share my screen. All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen. It looks good. All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you, Bruce, for inviting me. Um, so my name is Dahlia. I, uh, I am a developer lead at, in IBM. Um, I've uh, done this talk um, to developers that are interested in migrating beyond Java 8 because I know there is a lot of developers out there still using Java 8. A lot of times when I'm in person, I like to ask what are people actually using in the field? Um, so if you uh, can, post something in the chat and let me know what Java version you're running with. So I've seen a lot of people say they're right now they're running Java 8. Um, some folks are still running Java 7 and unfortunately I get questions about Java 6. Um, so let me know what Java versions you're running. I'm monitoring the chat, so I just kind of want to get a feel for where everyone's at. And I see Bruce is 14. Wow, okay. Awesome. Some six in here. And Kotlin. That's an interesting mix. Awesome. All right, and really quick, I'm going to ask folks to mute just so that I don't get some feedback. I'm getting some feedback. So if you're not talking, if you could mute your line, but otherwise, please give them off mute to ask questions. I love having questions, um, so feel free to do that. I'm going to go ahead and mute some folks. And their code themselves being around. This creates a reproducible bridge. All right. So a lot of folks are on eight, which is um, kind of the field is in on eight. So it's very expected. All right. So um, let's get started here. So a little bit about me. Um, I am the development lead uh, for the migration tools team at IBM. Um, our team's main goal is to make migrations easier. Uh, so we work with a lot of enterprise um, uh, companies like banks, retail, or insurance companies where they have thousands and thousands of applications and they need all the automation they can get. Um, so we come up with tooling to help them migrate and help them go to that newer environment. And I'm going to mute some folks here just because I'm hearing some background noise. Feel free to unmute yourself, of course. Um, so we've done migration development uh, tooling for a very long time, ever since even Java 5. So we've helped folks go from Java 5 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 8. And with Java 11, there was a little bit of uh, questions on how we're going to implement this, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but there is, uh, you know, do you implement it with Java 11? Do you implement it with Java 14? What's going on with those different versions? And I'll talk about that. Um, we've also have a lot of tooling for uh, helping folks go from an on-premise environment to the cloud, and you might be wondering, okay, what kind of things are you looking for? 
Um, if your application is making any database calls, for example, and we see that in an application, we'll tell you, okay, what are you planning to do with your database? Are you planning on moving your database with you? Are you planning to, um, you know, set up a connection back to your database? What, what's happening there? Or, for example, if you're containerizing your applications and you're, you're writing some files out to the file system, we'll tell you, by the way, that's not going to work. For example, in Docker, you should use Docker volumes or so on and so forth. So those are the kind of things that we do in our team. We do a lot of work with the application server team. Um, so I don't know if anyone's using WebSphere, but that's the uh, product that I work directly with and Open Liberty, of course. Um, so I'll be talking about our experiences from that point of view a little bit throughout the presentation, but this is very uh, application server independent. So you don't need to be running an, any app server. This is just pure Java. What's going to happen when you migrate from Java 8 to a newer version of Java? So the question that anyone should ask uh, when they're starting a project is, why should I migrate? My stuff is working just fine. It's on Java 8. Why do I even need to migrate? Well, first is there's tons and tons of new features that came out that are really cool. And I, I've seen actually Venkat's presentation. It's a great one. And it the, he talks about all the new features that came into Java since, you know, uh, Java 8. And, uh, you know, some of the features out there, if you look at the release uh, notes, you'll see lots and lots of features that came since Java 8. Some of my favorite features are, um, I like VAR. I know some people don't like VAR. Some people do like VAR. Uh, Venka even talks about how you can get people to start liking VAR. I, I'm a big fan just because I like concise code and I don't like repeating myself when I'm writing my code. Um, there's some new helper classes in the collection uh, class that I, helper methods in the collection class that I really uh, liked seeing. And I really like that they added the uh, easy single file launch uh, for any Java class. And I wanna show you an example of what, uh, what this enhancement would look like. So if I have an array list, I wanna have an unmodifiable list. Usually what you have to do with Java 8 or earlier is you declare an array list, you add in all your items, and then you uh, assign it to an unmodifiable list and then assign it back to your variable. Now with Java 11 and after, all you need to do is use the new of method in the list class and then just pass in the values that you want to initiate. And then I'm also taking advantage of var here so I went from five lines to one line and it's concise. You can know exactly what's going on there. So that's kind of a flavor of one of my favorite features. There's lots of really cool features. There's records, there's um, there's so many new features that are really cool out there. Um, so definitely check that out. The other reason to migrate is security improvements. So I. <laughs> During conferences, when I give this talk, some people ask me, uh, how do I convince management to upgrade uh, Java? Uh, and a lot of times I tell them, well, tell them there's security improvements. Uh, so TLS 1.3 came out in Java 11. If you want to, uh, if you're using TLS, you'll have to upgrade in order to get TLS 1.3. That's one of the big reasons to upgrade to Java 11 and any other security improvements. Uh, another reason that we care about it from our perspective, maybe you're not a library uh, developer, but if you are, you have to keep up with the Java versions in order to service the folks that are using your libraries. So for me and my team, we had to keep up with Java just so that uh, anyone that's using our tools can also use Java 11 or upgrade to Java 11 or after. And I need to minimize here. Just give me one sec. And of course, the obvious reason Java 8 will go away sometime in the future. Um, so in general, it's good to kind of take a step early and uh, migrate your applications before it's, uh, you know, it's right before the deadline. Um, it's also really nice because you can start using those new features and start kind of keeping up with the Java features and 
the Java versions and take advantage of new, uh, you know, the Java capabilities that are coming out. Okay, so we've covered the why. Now, what version of Java should you target? Back in the day, it was pretty clear. We had in 2006, we had Java 6 come out, and then five years later, Java 7 came out, and then three years later, Java 8 came out. So it was a pretty standard, okay, I'm coming from Java 6, I'm going to Java 7, I'm coming from Java 7, I'm going to Java 8. But things changed uh, when Oracle announced a new release cadence. What that means is we're going to get more frequent Java versions coming out. And this is where a long-term supported version concept came into place. This is when you have a one version that's designated long-term support. That means you have support for it for years, but then there is shorter releases that are coming out more frequently that come into play and go out of support when six months hit. So you saw that with Java 9. Java 9 came out in September 2017. It was in support for six months, and then it went out of support when Java 10 came out. So if you were on Java 9, you had to update to Java 10. And then Java 11 came out, and they designated that version long-term supported release. And you might be wondering, well, why that version? Because we were uh, we went a very long time without another long-term supported release, and they decided let's de designate Java 11 as a long-term supported release. And then we saw Java 12 came out, and that was one of those short-term supported releases or feature releases, a, another way of saying that. And then we had 13 come out, Java 12 came out, went out of support, and then Java 14 came out, and then 13 came out of support. So the point here is if you had upgraded to 12, you had to upgrade to 13 right after the six months mark. And we'll see that, so right now we're on Java 14, and we'll see more of those short-term release cycles coming out with Java 15, 16, and then Java 17 is the next long-term supported release. So why do I show this picture? Um, a lot of developers are saying, I am on Java 8, and right now we're on Java 14. I am way behind. And I always say, no, you're not behind. It's just that the release versions changed. Now you're getting more and more frequent Java versions, meaning that you get access to features faster, but doesn't mean that you're behind. If you care only about long-term supported uh, versions, which since I work in the enterprise world, a lot of times it's not really realistic to be asking developers to upgrade every six months. I tell them, okay, how about you upgrade to Java 11? And then when Java 17 comes out, you can upgrade to Java 17. So I tell them you should run LTS in production, or you can definitely run short the non-LTS versions in production if you have a good pipeline, a solid pipeline, and good testing where you know that you can just upgrade your Java version and test it and roll it right out. But no matter what, you should always set up continuous testing with non-LTS. This is gonna uh, prevent any pain down the road when you discover that there were some issues when you were migrating and you could have caught them early. So it's always good to set up your pipeline to be uh, testing with the latest non-LTS that, that way that you get to catch all those issues before they happen. I get this question all the time. Um, I'm looking for a free Java 11 build. Where do I get it? I get mine from Adopt Open JDK. So these uh, builds are available out there. You can download them for free. Um, you can choose the version that you want to download. Um, for me, I'm running Open JDK 11 with Open J9. You can choose Hotspot if you care about what JVM you're running, or you can uh, download Java 14 as well. Okay. So this is the meat of things. What are the top migration issues I should expect if I go from Java 8 to 11 or after? 
So in my research, I found that there is three main categories you should be expecting or anticipating some issues around. The first category is missing libraries. What that means is it used to be that Java SE provided you some uh, libraries that were part of Java SE itself and an application could depend on Java SE providing those libraries. Some of those got taken out of Java SE and they're expected to be pulled in separately and we'll talk about that in a minute. The second category is removed APIs. Those APIs were deprecated a very long time ago and Java has always been kind of lenient about their deprecated APIs where you just get a warning and you just keep doing it because it's still working. But starting Java 11 and after, the Oracle has decided that they want to be stricter about taking out any APIs that are deprecated and make sure that the only the supported APIs are in your application. So you'll see some of that impact your application as well. Third category is out of date dependencies. So if your application depends on any third party library, you're going to most likely need to update that in certain cases. And we'll talk about that in detail as well. So let's talk about the first category, missing libraries. So in Java 8, you have your application. It's calling into the uh, Java SE. And it's relying on Java SE to provide Java EE APIs. Um, so if you're using JAXP, JAXWS, Corba, JTA, any of these uh, libraries, you're relying on Java SE to provide them. If you're using Java Web Start or Java FX, you're also relying on Java SE to provide them. Now, starting Java 11 and after, those libraries are no longer in Java SE. They got taken out and moved elsewhere. Let's dig into that a little bit deeper. So these are all the modules that got removed. What that means is if your application is using any of these packages that I'm listed here, and I know there is a bunch of them here, that means when you upgrade to Java 11, you're going to get a compile failure because it can't find those classes or those packages. The biggest issue that I we ran into from an open liberty perspective and a lot of people in the field did is the JAXP libraries. And these are the libraries where you convert the Java object to XML. So you, your application might be using that. And when it when you go to Java 11, you try to call into Java C to, to get those libraries, you're not going to find them. So the solution to that, you have two options. The first option is package, package those dependencies as an extra dependency into your application. Second option is if you're using an app server, you could be you could rely on the app server to provide those libraries. So for us in on the Open Liberty team, we decided this change was disruptive enough that we made it very easy for folks that are migrating to Java 11 to just add one line to their configuration and get those libraries for free from the app server. So if you're not using an app server, you can just package up your dependencies right there. If you're interested in where the Java EE packages and where all that is headed, check out the Jakarta EE website. They have a lot of work in the Jakarta EE nine spaces happening right now with JAXP, JAXWS, JPA, all those um, uh, different, what used to be Java EE and now called Jakarta EE uh, projects and definitely check those out. If you're using Java Web Start, uh, the open sourced web start so you can use open web start instead instead of relying on java sc to provide that same with java fx it's actually available um, uh, as an open source project so that's the first category second category are removed apis so these are apis that were deprecated before and you have uh, you no longer can use them so let's look at that. And I'm going to go through those really quick just to give you a flavor of them. Don't get too hung up on all the details. I'll talk about tooling and how tooling can help you in this area. But I do want you to get an idea of what kind of issues you could run into when you upgrade. So in the package classes category, you have uh, these classes got removed. And when you're in, in an IT environment, you would have seen that they were deprecated before. Some of these were deprecated since 1.4, actually. Um, but they, they were still working, so a lot of people just ignore them. I ignore them, too. 
the problem is when you switch to Java 11, you're no wrong, you're going to get a compile failure. And at that point, the Solaris classes are actually a pretty easy fix because you just you replace Solaris with Unix and then you're good to go. So some of these are a pretty easy to replace. Some of them take a little bit more work. If you're using, for example, the JPEG packages, you can use uh, Java image IO, so on and so forth. And, and there's certain um, recommendation depending on what, what package you're using in your application. Some other categories, um, if you're using some of the internal binding uh, packages, those went away. If you really, really need to use them, you could uh, pull them in and remove the internal in the package and you, you can get access to some of those classes that were there before. A lot of the peer classes got removed. So one of the example of that is if you were on Java 8, you would have gotten a warning in your IDE but this one is a little bit interesting because you're not getting a warning because the method itself is deprecated. You're getting a warning because the object that the method is returning is deprecated. So what's going to happen is when you go to Java 11, you're going to get an error here. And the error is because the component peer object that the get peer method returns is no longer available. For uh, if you're doing something like this, you can get equivalent functionality using the button is displayable method. So some of these changes are a little bit more complicated than others. You can also see that the base 64 decoder and encoder classes got removed. Those were, um, I've seen those in the field as well. And some of the DOM classes got removed. There's, besides from packages and classes, we also saw methods getting removed. So a lot of the security manager methods got removed. Um, so same, same concept, you would have gotten a warning in case you're using some of those security manager methods, you could replace those with check permission calls and that will give you equivalent functionality as what you had before. So I noticed that a lot of times the finalizer, um, uh, finalizer related methods got removed and I was kind of doing some research to figure out what's going on there. And I found a bug that kind of explains the reasoning behind why we're seeing a lot of these getting removed. It has to do with uh, finalizer being problematic in a multi-threaded environment. So Oracle is encouraging folks to switch off of using finalizers to clean up their resources. You should be using, um, for example, try with resources to clean up your resources. I also saw that the stop method got removed. You should be using variables to control your threads instead. So a lot of, a lot of changes in the resource cleanup area where you want to look at your application, figure out, okay, why was I relying on these methods and why how can I clean up my resources a little bit safer so you don't get issues in the threading um, area? And I know those are some of the most difficult ones to debug anyways, so definitely check, check out what's happening in that area in your, for your application. The PAC 200 methods, some of those got removed as well. I do want to note that in Java 14, the PAC 200 class got removed altogether. So even though you can use these, um, uh, some of the replacement methods in Java 11, when you go to Java 14, you can no longer use PAC 200. And then some of the log manager methods got removed as well. So I talked about Java 11, some of the changes there. I do want to touch on Java 14. So it, it's up to you what you want to go to. You can go to Java 11, you can go to Java 14, but just to get an idea of what happened in Java 12, 13, and 14, I've included the changes here. The change list is a lot shorter because the time hasn't passed that much, so there hasn't been a lot of changes. We got the security warning class got removed. The ACL packages got removed. You're supposed to be using the uh, policy package instead. And then uh, PAC 200 got removed. So if you're using PAC 200 to compress your applications, you could use JLink or JPackage um, in that case. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, changes in the finalized uh, space. So I've seen a lot of classes where the finalized methods got removed, and I, I suspect we're going to see more and more of that uh, moving forward. 
So that's the second category. Third category is out of date dependencies. So you're probably depending on some third party packages. For example, for us, we depend on ASM, if you're familiar with it, it's a library that uh, scans bytecode, and we had to update that library, obviously, because we do some bytecode manipulation and we needed to upgrade in order to have it work with Java 11 and after. If you're using Makiro, you're gonna probably need to upgrade. If you're using Spring, you're gonna need to upgrade and so on and so forth. So some libraries are gonna be impacted, some libraries may not. If you're using any built tools, most likely you're gonna need to upgrade as well. So if you're using Greater or Maven, you're probably gonna need to upgrade. Any IDEs, I had to upgrade Eclipse, that's what I use. If you're using IntelliJ or VS Code, you're probably gonna need to upgrade as well. And if you're using any application servers, you're gonna need to upgrade. So for Open Liberty, you can upgrade to the latest and get support for Java 11 or 14. Some of the other uh, app servers as well have been adding support to the latest Java versions. Check out your app servers and figure out what version gives you support for Java 11 and after. My advice is take this time to go through your dependencies and figure out, can I upgrade to the latest? You're already gonna be doing a bunch of testing because you're doing all these upgrades. So might as well take the uh, time to upgrade your dependencies. And there are some automation tools that make that upgrade a little bit easier. And I'll show that in a few minutes. So what about modularity? I talked and talked and talked, didn't talk about modularity is a very hot topic in the Java space. In case you're not familiar with modularity and most of you probably are, but I'll cover it anyways. It's the idea of breaking up Java into different modules that an application can declare a dependency on. That way, if an application just needs a small piece of Java, it's not dragging everything in Java with it. And that really works well in a container environment. Um, so you need, you know, a light footprint, you need something uh, where you're not dragging a bunch of dependency that you don't need. The problem from a migration perspective is a Java 8 application has no concept of modules and it hasn't declared the dependencies that it needs. Luckily, there is a kill switch and it's a property called illegal access and it's set to permit by default. It used to be not set to permit and there were people on the field having issues with it. They set it to permit. I heard rumors that it might be set to deny or the kill switch might be off in Java 16. I'm not sure if that's actually gonna happen or not, but just FYI, it's the certain things that I'm hearing. The idea here is if, if you have this option, I would keep it to illegal access permit for now. And my advice is migrate to Java 11 with the, or 11 or after, with illegal access set to permit, fix everything else, all the things that I talked about, get that working and then figure out what you wanna do with modularity. Just because you don't wanna take too many big steps and then figure out that, okay, maybe it just works with Java 11 and you don't need to do anything with modularity. And there's a lot of uh, uh, resources in that area. So feel free to you know, go, go ahead and look at some of the presentations on this. One uh, survey that I actually found really interesting was the, from the JVM ecosystem report of this year. And it asked, are you using or planning on using modules in your Java applications? As you can see, 64% of people said no. 29% said yes, and then 7% said we already are. So what, what I'm hearing from the field is a lot of folks are just migrating to Java 11 or after. They're not worrying about modularity or breaking up their application into modules. So I don't want folks to not migrate because they're afraid that they're gonna have to break up their applications. No, you don't have to. If you don't wanna take advantage of modularity, you don't have to. All right, so we talked about all the different topics around this area. Now the question is, what tools can I use to make my migrations easier? And we'll talk about different tools today. The first one is the tool that my team developers, it's a binary scanner tooling 
that um, scans your bytecode, your application bytecode, and it tells you if we found any issues that are gonna be problematic when you go to Java 11 or after. So this, um, this tool is available. Uh, there's a link over here and I'll, I'll definitely upload the presentation. It's free for commercial and personal use, so feel free to use it. Um, and I have also included a link to the documentation. So this, this tool, I'm gonna show you how it works, but this tool is meant to help you figure out how do I migrate my application and how do I fix any issues I'm gonna run into when I migrate. The other tool that's useful is JDEPS. JDEPS is a tool that's actually in the JDK itself. So starting, I think, JDK 8, they started packaging JDEPS. Um, one note in this area, if you're gonna run JDEPS, make sure you're running JDEPS that came with your target Java. So make sure you're switching to Java 11 or 14 or whatever, and then running JDEPS there. Because if you can imagine, if you run the JDEPS in Java 8, it's not gonna know about all the packages that got removed from Java 8 to 11. So just make sure that you've switched your target Java when you're, when you're running JDEPS. The relevant option in JDEPS is GDK internals. It'll tell you if it found any internal APIs in your application, and it will tell you some suggestions on what to replace them. When I was looking at JDEPS in general, and I was like, it, it looked really promising, but there were certain things that were missing from it. For example, it didn't flag the Java EE packages that got removed, um, and it didn't flag some of the methods that got removed. So what we ended up doing was we ended up having the binary scanner recommend running JDEPS if the binary scanner detects that you're using any internal APIs. That way, one person can just run the binary scanner. If it doesn't tell you to run JDEPS, you don't have to. But if it tells you to run JDEPS, you can run JDEPS and see if it provides any more insight than what you had with the binary scanner. And I included a link to the documentation over here as well. Last tool that can help a little bit in this area is some dependency tooling, um, uh, updating tooling. So there are some uh, tools like Dependapod that would take your Gradle file or Maven file, look at your dependencies and auto updates your dependencies for you. Those are really nice just because it can get tedious and manual to do that. And they will generate um, generate what you need to do in order to update your, your dependencies. I'll show that in a minute. And it makes it a little bit easier for you. So those are some of the tools you could use and I will jump right into the demo here. But before I do, are there any questions? All right, well, let's jump into the demo. All right, so the way I wanted to show this today is I wanted to show you a sample application that's running on Java 8. It's really basic. I just wrote something up that I wanted to uh, showcase the kind of issues you could run into if you migrate your Java 8 application to Java 11 or after. So let me show you a little bit what this application is doing. So I have an application. It's using JAXP. So I have this weather object. If you look at the weather objects over here, it has a city, a state, a country, and a forecast. So it's using JAXP to uh, convert my Java object to XML. So I'm gonna create an object uh, for Rochester. That's where I live. And I'm gonna have a forecast. It's been very rainy today. So that's what I set it to. I'm gonna write it out to XML. I also wanted it to be a little bit more interesting. So I'm doing some encoding and decoding. So I'm gonna encode the forecast and then decode the forecast. Of course, this is really, basic sample application, don't take it too seriously, but just to showcase the kind of things that you could have in your application. So I have my app over here, and the first thing I wanna do is I want to figure out what Java version I'm running. So right now I'm running with Java 8. I'm going to run my app. So by the way, I'm using Gradle just because I wanted to mess around with Gradle. If you're using Maven, it's gonna be very similar steps. 
and let's run it and see what it does. So what it did is it took my weather object, converted it to XML. So you have Rochester, Minnesota, USA, rainy. It took my forecast, it encoded it, it took my encoded uh, forecast and it decoded it. So it works just fine, just like your app is working just fine in Java 8. So you can guess what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna switch to Java 11. I have a script that just sets the path for me so I don't have to do it. And then I'm gonna check the version. All right, so I'm running Java 8, uh, not Java 8. I just switched to Java 11 or you could switch to Java 14. And now I want to run my application and see what happens. Okay, so it looks like it found a lot of issues. At this point in time, if your application ran just fine, that means that there's probably not issues in your app and you can go on and move to the next step of your testing and do all that good stuff. But if you have a bunch of uh, errors when you try to run your app with Java 11 like this, you have two options. First option is you go through it, you Google away, you try to fix it, you Google away, you try to fix it, and all of that. The second option is to use a tool like what I just talked about, like the binary scanner, and see if it can give you any insight on what exactly do you need to do in order to move to Java 11. So let me show you what that looks like. So here's the binary scanner. Um, I'm gonna paste a link to the binary scanner so you can download it. It's just a jar, it's very small. It takes like um, you know a couple seconds to uh, install. Just call java-jar on it, on the installer jar, and then it expands and it has a lot of information here. But ultimately you run the installer and it will install into a default directory called WMT, and you have the jar right there, and it takes two minutes. So um, it's really simple. We have the PDF that goes along with it. This is where the documentation lives. So if you have any questions or you wanna read about what else it does, there's a lot that the binary scanner does, but, but I just wanna cover the Java SC portion of it. So I installed the binary scanner, and I wanna run it against my application. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take my binary scanner. So this is the path to, path to my binary scanner. The first step is to point it at my uh, application that I want to scan. Remember, this is a binary scanner. So it needs access to either your jar or your war or your ear. In my case, I have a jar, so that's what I'm gonna do. And it's in, I think, the lib directory. Let's see, yep, it's right there. So that's where my jar is. Next step is to tell the binary scanner exactly what you want it to look for. In my case, I wanna analyze for Java SE changes. Like I said, there's a lot of rules in here. There's cloud rules, there's runtime rules, there's a lot of different rules, and I wanna Trim it down to, I just care about Java and what happened with Java 8 to 11. So naturally, I need to tell it what source Java I'm coming from. For me, I'm coming from IBM 8. You could be running with Oracle 8. You could be running with, I think there, someone said 6. So you could do 6. It'll catch everything that came from 6 all the way to 11. But in my case, I'm running from Java, um, IBM Java 8. So that's what I'm going to say. And then I'm gonna say the target Java. So if you're going to 11, you can type in 11. If you're going to 14, you can type in 14. And we've been trying to keep up with the versions as much as we can, but we're also um, having a hard time, you know, keeping up with it. So definitely don't feel like you're the only one having a hard time keeping up with things. But uh, right now we do have Java 14 support and hopefully when 15 comes out, we will add that support as well. But since I've been talking about 11 a lot and I talk about you know enterprise world and all that stuff, that's what I'm gonna run today. And that's it. I'm running my scanner against my application and I'm looking for issues coming from Java 8 to 11. And then click run. And it ran really quick because my app is so small. If your app is realistic, it's gonna take 
a, 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 not a very long time. It will depend on how big your app is. If you have XML files that are like, I've seen 10 megabyte XML files, that's gonna take a long time. Um, if your app is small, it's gonna take less time than an app that's big, just because it's going through each class and each file in your application and scanning it. So I just wanna show you what happened here. I ran the command, it printed out this uh, message, and I like to point out this message mainly because some folks ask me, okay, wh what is this message for? This message is telling you about the packages we exclude by default. The reason we exclude certain packages by default is because we know there are third party libraries that we really don't need to be scanning because you're either gonna upgrade them or do something with them, but you're not gonna actually be changing any code in there. So there's no point from scanning those third party libraries. However, if your company name starts with any of these packages, you might need to override this option. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Check out the list here. For example, we have a lot of Calm IBM uh, packages in ours, so we have to override it. But if your company name doesn't start with any of these, you don't have anything to worry about. You can just go on and uh, scan away and take the defaults. I hope that makes sense. If anyone has questions, let me know. So it scans the application and it produces an HTML report. That's why you saw it just pop out really quickly because it automatically pops it up in your browser if that's available. So here's my HTML report. At the very top, it tells me what I specified. I'm coming from eight to 11. Don't worry about the Liberty portion. It's just telling you, don't worry about the runtime and all the excluded packages that are up here. And then it points out the issues in three categories. You have the first category as severe issues. Those are the issues that are very likely gonna cause issues when you go to Java 11 or after. You have warnings. Warnings are ones that are likely to be issues, but we're not super sure. So we're gonna tell you about them. You should check them out and figure out what you need to do in that area. And then information are things that should be in the back of your mind. Just read about them. Just in case you go to Java 11, you find the problem and then you're wondering, okay, why is this there? Oh, I read about that in the report. Maybe that's what I'm running into. So informational ones are kind of safe to ignore, uh, but I would just look at it and read it and figure out, okay, you know, do I need to do anything with it? So let's check out the first severe issue that I found in my application. Okay, first issue is do not use APIs from some package. So I look at that and I don't know what that means. I, I expand the rule help. So it's telling me that some of the Sun packages are not supported because they're internal APIs and they got removed. And it tells me if you use Base64 Base encoder or decoder, those were removed from Java 11, you should be using Base64 instead. And maybe I'm wondering, and there's more data here, but maybe I'm wondering, okay, where exactly am I calling this? Well, if you click show results, it'll tell you I'm calling it in my class and here are the line numbers where we found these hits. So this is using ASM to get those line numbers. Sometimes the line numbers are a little bit off, but in general, they're in the right area. So um, this will narrow down on where exactly in your application you're gonna need to address these issues. Second issue it found was, looks like Java XML bindings is missing. So JAXB, like I said, was removed Java SC and instead moved so that you can bring those in as a dependency. If you look at the help, it'll list out the packages that are impacted. If you're using uh, Liberty, then you can just enable the JAXB feature. If you're not using Liberty or any app server, you're gonna bring it into your application and package it up. And then you'll have those libraries accessible right in there. If you click show results, you'll notice there's only one result, mainly because we didn't wanna keep telling you about every instance of your application using JAXP. If you package up the library, you're done. So it's a one-time change and you don't need to do anything anymore. So that's why it's only highlighted once. The third thing it found was, it looks like it's recommending that I run JDEPs. So it found some internal APIs and it's telling me, by the way, maybe you should run JDEPs in case there are cer certain information you would 
uh, find helpful using JDEPS. So in here, it talks about JDEPS and it tells you how to run it. And again, it's giving it to me once just because you're using internal APIs, just scan it once and it'll tell you all the things that are in there that are problematic. Wonderful, ran the report, walked through the report, read a little bit about it, let's dig in. So the first hit that we wanna dig into is this, do not use APIs from Sun package. So it looks like something in my app, it looks like around line 56, looks like I have a question here. Can the tool be used for Java 14 or 17 migrations as well? Yes, it can. So you can do this and just say 14. Uh, and you can do the same thing if you're coming from 11. For example, you can do Java 11 like this. So that's how you would run it. It's just uh, determining what kind of rules you're coming from and what kind of rules you're going to. Does that make sense? Awesome. And as the tool gets updated, we update it on a quarterly basis. So hopefully when 70 comes out, we can uh, run, we can update the tool so that those rules are available as well, but they haven't come out with the compatibility guide yet. So we can't really do anything with it right now, but there is Java 14 support as of today. All right, um, so first hit that we found was about the um, uh, internal APIs. Around line 56, you know, they're not really in order just because ASM gives us hits in so different orders. But in general, it looks like 56, 45, 46, 50. So let's go back to our application. So there's my application. It looks like um, 56. So it looks like it doesn't like it here and it doesn't like it there and here. If you notice, it looks like Eclipse was even warning me about this, but I ignored it because it's just a warning. Um, but it looks like it's gonna be a problem if I switch to Java 11. Well, I really wanna see that in person. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch my build path to use Java 11. And there we go, we're red. Um, I really like the visual just so that I know exactly what I should be looking at. But then I go back to my report and I'm wondering, okay, how do I fix this? Well, it says if you're using base 64 encoder, you should use base 64 from the util package. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I've done a little bit of research about this, so I know what to do here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace it with base 64.encoder. And it's gonna be a little bit different here. It's gonna be in coder dot, um, no, keep um, forgetting. Yep, so that's how uh, you get the encoder from the base64 class. And then you'll notice the method is not the same for some of the um, functionality that you used to have before. So instead I'm gonna say encode the string because I'm converting it to um, to a string. And that's how I'm gonna fix that first one. So now it's happy. Moving on to the next hit. It looks like it doesn't like my decoder class here. So I'm gonna do something very similar. I'm gonna do base64 dot get decoder. It's not gonna like my method because the methods have changed. You can look at the Java doc and figure out, okay, what's the equivalent method? That's what I ended up doing, save. Something's still off here because my exception is no longer being thrown. So I can remove it altogether because it's no longer needed. All right. And then I'm going to reformat. So that looks good. So we fixed the first problem. All right. Let's go back to the report. So that's the first problem. Second problem is JAXP. So it looks like I'm using JAXP and it's not liking that I, um, let me, Let's remove those on ports so that it uh, can show up right here. And um, okay, so it doesn't like JAXP, and that's why we were getting all those errors above. So if you noticed, it was telling me, okay, I can't find JAXP, I can't find JAXP. The way to fix that is you go to your Gradle or Maven file and you import or 
add that dependency on JAXP. In this case, um, I wanted to add the Jakarta package because that's where JAXP lives now. I had it drive over here, just commented it out. You can look uh, for all the different coordinates for where you need to be getting JAXP or JAXWS or any of those Java E packages. I'm going to click save and I refresh. It's, it usually gives me a compile failure in the um, view here, but it didn't right now, mainly because Eclipse sometimes takes a, a few minutes to refresh. Okay, so I fixed that. Now let's figure out the third hit. The hit, third hit was saying run JDEPS. So I look at that and then say, okay, let me run JDEPS really quick and see what it gives me. So let's go all the way down here. And the way to run JDEPS is to make sure you're on the right, the target Java version. So in this case, I'm running with Java 11. If you're on Java 14, make sure you switch to Java 14 so you can run JDEPS in there. And you simply call JDEPS, JDK internals, and then you point it at your jar. Now, the difference between the binary scanner and JDEPS is the binary scanner actually accepts ears and wars and directories of ears and wars and jars. JDEPS only accepts jars or class files. So you might need to expand it depending on what you're doing. So I'm going to point it at my jar. And I'm going to run JDEPS against my jar and see what it produces. So I ran it. The output is a little bit hard to read. So let's take a look here. It looks like it found my class. It told me you're using base 64 decoder, base 64 encoder. And down below, it tells me the suggested replacements. So it looks like it's the same info that the binary scanner was giving us. So there is nothing new here. We already fixed it. So we don't really need to do anything for this case. If you're using other internal APIs, maybe you see something here that's actually useful and you want to use that instead. So that's how you run JDEPS. Okay, so I think that's all we had in this report. So let's try to run um, run our application and see what happens. And this is always when I'm, uh, you know, hoping for the best. Gradle W build run. Awesome. So it looks like it ran with Java 11 because we fixed those issues. So we fixed that first category of issue, which is we had inside of it, it was using a base 64 encoder, decoder, some of those internal APIs. They were no longer available, so we need to replace them. The other category was the missing dependency, JAXP, so we included that in the application, and that worked. Um, and then if you have any up out of date APIs, you're going to need to update as update that as well. So we fixed our app. Hopefully that it happens magically to you too. But of course, it's not going to be as smooth just because your app is bigger, and uh, you know you'll probably do some trial and error, all that stuff. But hopefully you get that green and uh, things run for you. All right. So really quick before we jump back to finishing up the presentation, I do want to show you I did. Um, uh, did upload all my source code is available on GitHub here. So in case, and it's going to be in the links as well, in case you want to play around with it, it's right here. And I want to show you the Bentabot. So I set up the Bentabot on my repository so I can have that automatic updates. So remember that third category of out of date dependencies. I wanted to just set up a tool that would look at my Gradle file and update the dependencies for me. And you might be wondering, okay, what does that look like? Well, I'm using GitHub. So what it does is it looks at my Gradle file or Maven file. It sees that I have a out of date dependency. Like for example, I'm using JUnit. It's going to create a pull request for me. It's going to tell me all the information I need and all I need to do is merge it in. Of course, the asterisk here is make sure you have testing and all that in mind, just because you don't want to, you know, update things and things break and all that stuff. You just want to be careful with it. But it's definitely it was very nice and easy to just click that merge button. So that's that was useful for me. Hopefully, uh, you find a tool like that, not necessarily depend about, but something like that that eases up your updating your dependencies. All right, awesome. So let's go back to our demo. 
So what are my next steps? So first step, oh, there's a question in the chat before I do that. So your Eclipse IDE works with Java 8 and Java 11. Yes, so I actually had to update Eclipse in order to get Java 11 support. So if you have a really old version of Eclipse and you try to uh, use Java 11 or 14 with it, even 14, it's probably not gonna really work very well. So if you're using IntelliJ or Eclipse or anything, you want to update your IDs as well in order before you do any of this work. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So next steps, what should I do next? First step is just try to run your application with Java 11 and see what happens. If it's successful and everything is good, then you don't have to worry about anything I talked about from a tooling perspective. But if it doesn't, and it, it's, nah, I don't want to say likely, but it, there's, there has been a lot of developers in the field reporting that they have had issues going to Java 11. So if you've had issues, then your two options are Google away and do all the um, investigation yourself, or you run a tool like the binary scanner and included the command right here so you can just copy paste it. And then you run it with your options and you figure out, okay, what is the binary scanning telling me to do? You fix your application code and you rebuild and you run. Um, it's probably not gonna be as smooth as I just showed you just because, you know, you, you know, we're, we're software developers, we have to reiterate and try something and then see if it fixes it. So you're gonna have to do step one through three a few, a few times and see, okay, what's not working anymore, all that stuff. Um, or it can be pretty simple and you fix it from the first attempt. You're going to want to update your dependencies. So that question about Eclipse IDE, you want to be updating that. You want to update your grader or your Maven um, um, or any of your, um, you know, if you're using Spring, if you're using an app server, Liberty, you're going to, you know, update on any of those dependencies. Some of them will need updating, some will not. You'll, you can try and see what is causing issues. And make sure you run all your testing. So testing is going to be very critical. If you've ever done migrations, you know sometimes you don't hit the, just the right path. So you want to be hitting those different paths and making sure that your application still works. Lastly, you should celebrate. I always say, like, make sure that you celebrate that accomplishment because it feels great to successfully migrate your application. It's a one-time thing. Hopefully, once you do it, then you don't have to go through that again. Uh, until the next Java version, of course. Um, and let me know if the tools helped or didn't help. I've been getting really good feedback from the field and feeding it right into the tool for other people to uh, benefit from. So if you end up running any of the tools that I talked about and they helped you or didn't help you, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Some helpful links for you. Um, so I went through the demo. You can listen to the playback or you can look at the written instructions. I have a blog post over here because I know some people just want the written instructions of everything I talked about today. Um, a link to the binary scanner is over here. You can check out the documentation. Also, if you're using Eclipse, we actually have an Eclipse plugin tool that does what the binary scanner does, except it does it in your IDE. So it's scanning your source code. And I can show that in a little bit if we have time. It scans your source code and tells you issues right within Eclipse itself, so you don't have to go back and forth between line numbers. So um, folks really find it helpful if they're using Eclipse. Some folks uh, are using IntelliJ, and they've asked me, okay, do you have anything for IntelliJ? Not yet. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have that sometime. Um, but if you're using Eclipse, check out that plugin. And I also included a link to the GitHub repo that I just showed you, the JVM ecosystem report that I found uh, very interesting. It's a really good read. Um, Oracle Java SC support roadmap. If you're wondering about any of the support dates, this is a good link to look at. And then if you're migrating from Oracle Java to adopt OpenJDK, I know a lot of folks are trying that. Um, you can check out this article on how to do that. If you're curious about what we ended up having to do in the Open Liberty team to get Java 11 uh, support and later, uh, you can check out this blog by Andy Gebert. We just kind of highlight, okay, here is our experiences and what we ended up having to do. Um, sometimes it helps to figure out, okay, what else did other people 
uh, have issues with when they're migrating. And that's all I wanted to share today. So I'm going to open it up for questions, comments, anything like that. And come up, make sure you unmute. It's either a quiet group or folks are figuring out WebEx and seeing if they can unmute. I have a question. Um, this is Asha. Um, yeah. um, did you have any roadblocks when you were trying to migrate? I mean, I, I understand the report is comprehensive and it gives you all the, um, you know, all, all the migration um, errors and, and you can kind of, uh, you know, look through that. But are there any other roadblocks that you have encountered within you know, your code or within your implementation of it that we need to be made aware of? Or anything? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of the things that we ran into um, are outside, were outside of the scope of the application itself. Like, for example, when we tried to run the tool, um, we got a lot of issues because we were using a third party library called ASM that was causing issues. And we just didn't figure that out. Uh, uh, without looking at the stack and figuring out where the error is coming from. So if it's a third party library, you're not going to get a lot of hints from the tool itself because it's scanning your own application code. Um, so that's an area where it's kind of outside of the scope of the tools. There's also um, some of the other, uh, there's a, a compatibility guide. Let me bring that up really quick because that's a great question. So um, let's see. Um, da, 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 compatibility guide. So, with every Java version, there's a long comp compatibility guide that tells you everything that changed. Um, so, for example, if you're using any um, uh, JVM options or anything like that that got removed, well, we can't scan that in the tools. So you might have issues because those are no longer there. And I'm going to paste this link in the chat. But there are certain things outside of the scope of um, the tools that we just can't detect for because we're doing a static scan and not really looking at your options themselves. Um, and those are the things that you're just going to try and see if, if it worked or not. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Are those tools secure enough? Um, secure enough in what way? So we do a lot of um, security analysis on these tools, just part of the IBM process. We make sure that, you know, no one can use it maliciously. It is a local tool. It's not uploading anything anywhere. So it's just a jar that you download and you run the tool on your local machine. So we don't get any access to your reports. We don't get access to anything. It's just a local tool. So you don't have any, uh, some some of our customers don't like their data being shared anywhere. So we take that very seriously. We don't do anything uh, like that. It's just a local tool. You could even turn off the internet access and run the tool and it works just fine. So uh, definitely secure from that standpoint. Uh, another standpoint, we make sure that uh, no one can get in and add some bad data or whatever, but even if they do, they're sabotaging their own local machine. So you can't really do anything with that. So yeah, we've done a lot of uh, security related scanning just to make sure that the tools are good to go. Um, but that's just generally what we do with any IBM software. We, we make sure that from a security standpoint, they're safe. I hope that answered that question. Cool. Um, other questions? I had another question. Um, does the code have to be packaged as a jar uh, for it to be scanned or? So whatever you have, so you, if you have a jar or you have a war or you have an ear, you can scan those. If you're using Eclipse, and that's a good segue to that. If you're using Eclipse, um, there is an Eclipse plugin that scans your source code itself. And uh, I've included a link to it. Once you install the plugin, what you have to do is you run an analysis on 
your uh, project here. It's kind of a mess right now because I didn't really plan on demoing too much. But what happens is you select the rule set that you want. In this case, um, I'm not doing anything with my runtime. I tell it I'm coming from, you know, whatever Java version I'm coming from. I'm going to whatever Java version I'm going to. You could do 14 or 11. You click OK, you analyze. And what this is going to do is it scans your source code itself, and then it gives you all, all the issues that the binary scanner showed you. And if you double click on this, it will go to the line that has an issue. And if you click F1, it'll show you that same help that I saw in the binary scanner. It'll tell you what you need to do. Are you using Eclipse or are you using IntelliJ? I, uh, we use IntelliJ, and I was wondering if there was a plugin for that as well. Yes, so I've gotten that question a lot. Um, a lot of folks use IntelliJ. We're, we're talking about it. It is, a, it is a possibility. It's just not available right now. Um, so for now, are you packaging up your application as a jar or a war or a ear? What kind it's, of application do you have? It's it's an old war. Uh, it's a war? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what you need to do for that is you go back to your scan and you just point it at your war. So yours is going to be a war. That's all you need to do. And if you have an ear, you just point it at your ear. You can even point it at a folder that has a bunch of wars and ears and jars. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? All right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I will leave it here. If you have any other follow-ups or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me on email or on Twitter. Um, I am uh, very happy to answer questions. And if you run the tools, please let me know how that went for you, if it was helpful, if it was not, so we can continue to improve those tools. So thank you very much for having me. All right, thank you, Dahlia. I don't know if you can hear me if I've unmuted myself okay, but. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Usually at this time, we have a big round of applause, but I don't know how we do that virtually. <laughs> so I think we can we can end the recording at this point. All right. Let me and stop And we can start working.